Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first uh, Paul S. Byard Memorial Lecture here at the school. Uh, this is an evening to celebrate the wisdom and charm of our dear colleague, Paul. Paul, until last year, was the director of our historic uh, preservation program, and we miss him uh, every day. Paul was an extraordinarily eloquent, passionate, and cultivated voice. He kept coaxing us, always coaxing us on, with a kind of relentless call for us to simply understand one idea, that preservation is a progressive art form with a kind of intellectual and design challenge of the very highest level that would demand of all of us our very, very best work. In a sense, what Paul kept saying is that preservation is first and foremost an adventurous act, and with every adventure, responsibility, and he called on us to be responsible. In fact, he argued that taking care in some way with old buildings, and for Paul, as you know, taking care of a building might mean also knocking a wall down uh, and revealing something about that building that wasn't seen before. But taking care of an old building, for him, was crucial to the public good. Uh, his mission remains absolutely crucial to us, to the program, and to the wider school. Uh, and it's just very moving for us um, that Paul's wife is here today, and I do hope that she will join us every year in celebration of our wonderful companion and our kind of cheerleader. We're short of a cheerleader right now. Uh, and in so doing, I guess all we're really going to be doing is to continue to celebrate the idea that preservation itself is a forward-thinking celebration of life, that it's all about life, that it's a way of looking at something that seems gone, seems dead, and speak only of and encourage and incubate life. Uh, tomorrow, the annual Fitch Colloquium in honor of the first director of the Historic uh, Preservation Program, Jim Fitch, is dedicated to twin phenomenon preservation and modern architecture in Latin America with a wonderful lineup of speakers curated by Jorge Terrapayos, the editor of Future Interior uh, Magazine, and you're all incredibly welcome to join that event. So we're really super suspended this weekend between life and death, um, which I suppose we always are, but somehow visible today. And preservation is once again calling on us to get smarter, faster, deeper, longer, sharper, and I would say more tender. And that's what Paul always, always brought to us. Uh, and, and I would also say uh, it's crucial to remember that sharpness and tenderness are absolutely not opposites. And the, to the extent that we understand that, we can do stuff. And in that spirit, I think uh, nothing would have touched Paul's spirit uh, and person more than having Rem Kohlhaas uh, give this lecture uh, tonight. It's absolutely no surprise that the architect who's done more than any other architect to address the intelligence deficit in our discipline uh, has increasingly become a student of preservation. And we in turn, I think, are touched by the fact that this architect is willing to share his latest thinking about life and death in buildings in the very moment of having lost a very beautiful building just immediately before it was meant to open. Uh, I, I mean, a, a shocking, a shocking kind of absence created exactly in that moment. It's always a pleasure to welcome Rem back to this room, but I would say more than ever tonight, I think it's, it's really crucial for us to tender our affection to such a close and dear colleague in the name of another close and dear colleague, uh, Rem. Sorry, there's some kind of technical. Are you? Um, I would lie uh, if I would say that uh, I would have picked this moment uh, to give a lecture about preservation. Uh, but there I am. Um, and uh, what, what I'm trying to do uh, tonight is uh, give give you a context of why we became as interested in preservation as we uh, are at the moment. Um, I have to start with uh, the kind of general situation and also uh, with the kind of general situation of the architect. Uh, and I want to very briefly kind of suggest uh, in what ways the economy uh, already for a quite a long period, at least 20 or 30 years, has been uh, eroding uh, some of the kind of important potentials uh, of architecture and has been kind of reducing uh, 
what architects can do uh, to a very limited uh, uh, band, perhaps. Uh, and maybe no image is kind of clear in terms of what happened to architect and this one, which is kind of really representing architecture in a way that we all kind of recognize it and, and presumably all respect and like it. Uh, the kind of regime of the last uh, 20, 25 years, uh, which is the Yes regime, the regime of the market economy, uh, which really infiltrated every single area and pocket of uh, previous uh, autonomy uh, and uh, turned architecture uh, in a drastically different art. As this was architecture 30 years ago, a kind of very serious uh, effort uh, uh, using workers and kind of presumably uh, producing buildings uh, that were not luxury uh, items uh, but necessary. Uh, and therefore not necessarily committed to immediate beauty uh, or obvious beauty, but uh, in a genuine way uh, much more interested in doing what was necessary. Uh, I think that that kind of architecture uh, is gone. Uh, it's a very interesting question whether it is gone forever. Uh, or whether uh, under certain circumstances we can imagine that it uh, come, will come back but in any case it's gone for now. I, I think that also uh, uh, to be considered a genius for kind of producing this kind of serene uh, order is also obviously over and I think that uh, perhaps Gary whether he wants to or not is, is the most obvious emblem of what happened to architecture or what we have made happen to architecture. Uh, Bilbao uh, kind of remains uh, a very beautiful building in itself, uh, but uh, its consequences are still with us and, and not necessarily uh, very um, enjoyable. Um, I think that uh, this is perhaps uh, a dramatic or exaggerated version of what has happened to the architect uh, himself. This is Peter Eisenman uh, in the center uh, of his uh, monument. And he is being pursued by uh, a horde, not of people, uh, not of uh, people who want to remember, but kind of simply uh, the press. Uh, and you can uh, imagine that they want from him a quote uh, and so therefore he is there uh, as a kind of involuntary minotaur, uh, uh, but uh, with uh, the press in hot pursuit. Um, I, th I think that uh, uh, our architecture and, and the kind of role architects play and what has happened to architecture is embodied by all of us, uh, whether we want to or not. Uh, and therefore all of us are becoming kind of increasingly uh, people who have to suggest things, uh, propose things in situations that are becoming increasingly undignified. Uh, and, and what we harvest uh, is, is a kind of very strange uh, and a very ambiguous uh, good. Uh, because on the one hand, we have unlimited uh, amount of attention, but I would say that uh, less and less people, people take us seriously. And, and kind of between that uh, contradiction, uh, there's like a really wrenching feeling of uh, sensing the, the lifeblood uh, of the discipline uh, kind of draining uh, away. Now, uh, at some point, I don't know who was responsible, the kind of word star architect uh, was invented. Um, and uh, we all know what it is. It's a kind of term of uh, derision. Uh, and uh, at some point it becomes very hard to avoid. Uh, and I would say that uh, uh, preservation is uh, for us a kind of refuge uh, to this uh, uh, term, uh, for this term. Uh, and what we're hoping to do, and. In fact, what I'm kind of showing uh, tonight is a number of strategies uh, in which we are uh, working to uh, undo this label or to escape from this label. 
Um, I would say that kind of, for instance, uh, CCTV, which started so innocently, and, and here you see it in all its white kind of simplicity, and which certainly was not uh, intended to be uh, a kind of exaggerated or dramatic building, but just uh, a kind of beautiful building uh, uh, with a certain intelligence uh, which worked in a particular way and which had uh, to offer uh, for the Chinese um, society perhaps a first uh, evidence or first moment where uh, its public could enter the inner workings uh, of Chinese media, and therefore, which was uh, kind of is in fact uh, kind of more or less a political statement, kind of somehow uh, it became easy to kind of subsume uh, even uh, that kind of uh, intention into the kind of overall label of star architecture, with its kind of detested g glamour and kind of oversimplifications even though the building uh, as made uh, has uh, a kind of rather astonishing ability to uh, engage with the most uh, base part uh, of the city uh, and the kind of most uh, historic part of the city, the imperfect part of the city, uh, as if it has a kind of secret sympathy for exactly those dimensions uh, and not necessarily part of a kind of grotesque, uh, exaggerated uh, form of uh, involuntary newness. But it is true that if you look at the total effect of all of us together, uh, that there is a certain grotesque uh, quality uh, and that perhaps the city uh, is doomed uh, or was doomed, and perhaps in that sense a crisis uh, offers some reason for optimism, uh, is doomed or was doomed to uh, be this grotesque. This is uh, the work of uh, some of the kind of major architects of the last uh, uh, 10 years uh, together. And whatever their individual qualities uh, may be, it is very clear that together uh, it doesn't have a cumulative impact uh, uh, and, and that uh, somehow it is mysteriously uh, self-canceling uh, and, and therefore not really productive. But maybe this moment, uh, at least it, it spells the end of the yes regime uh, and, and maybe uh, these uh, uh, events will uh, spell not only the end of capitalism, the end of bling. Uh, and maybe uh, if you can reverse uh, this uh, tendency, there will be maybe more planning, uh, maybe more rating, maybe more thinking, and maybe more feeling uh, even in architecture. So in that sense, I think that we are living through uh, a very positive moment. Uh, potentially. Now, uh, I mentioned, uh, and, and it's no secret, I think, that the label or the status of SAR architect has been uh, a, a very kind of unpleasant byproduct uh, of the current moment uh, for us and for me personally. And uh, for that reason, uh, I want to share with you uh, a number, quite intimately, a number of Strat private strategies and private kind of reflections of how to come uh, out of this. And kind of some of these reflections also are, are inevitably connected uh, with my own uh, experience. Uh, I was born in Rotterdam, and that kind of simply meant that uh, I was surrounded, uh, uh, maybe from the age of 10 or 12, but it's very inert uh, and, and now perhaps not very inspiring uh, blocks in this kind of architecture, but which uh, for me never had the kind of slightest uh, quality of gloom, but, but were always uh, the pure and full expression of optimism and to some extent even pleasure. And, and maybe it's incomprehensible now to read at this uh, architecture in those terms, but uh, I uh, 
uh, uh, still um, am susceptible to those kind of emotions uh, when I, I see these elements and absolutely jealous uh, if you see with how little uh, only uh, 40 years ago the architect could uh, establish uh, an maybe not earnestness and maybe also not sol sol solemnity uh, but seriousness which in itself can be a kind of very cheerful uh, and joyful practice uh, as I think Mies for instance got to practice that and so one of the elements and one of the directions that we have been trying to uh, exploit or pursue uh, in the search from, for an alternative for uh, the kind of unique uh, and the obligation for uniqueness is of course the generic and what we have been trying to do is to see whether we could be by being radically um, radically not simple but radically pu pure maybe we could kind of regain some uh, initiative um, w the first experiment in that direction was kind of three four years ago kind of when we had to conceive on this place in the dubai, dubai desert uh, a building uh, that had to be the center of a, a complex called business bay in, in that sense the absolute essence of the current uh, moment both in terms of city and in terms of economy uh, and there we felt that we could experiment perhaps with a degree of radicalism uh, and where we uh, there pursued and proposed a huge slab uh, of a building uh, made uh, out of monolithic white concrete and, and nothing else that would uh, arise from the desert the building was kind of conceptualized as a kind of piece of city put uh, on its edge uh, with kind of more or less the same uh, program uh, all the kind of facilities of the city and then kind of interrupted by four major kind of public zones uh, it was a slab 200 by 300 meters uh, 900 by 600 feet it had ribs uh, against uh, the sun uh, and some real and some kind of suggested uh, objects. It was built uh, as an extrusion, as an elevator shaft uh, out of white concrete. So very quickly, and the moment it would be finished, uh, the building would be finished. It didn't have cladding or anything else. And we worked uh, on layers of culture, uh, some accommodation for business, some accommodation for urban life, etc., etc. And we worked with some artists uh, that for the moment uh, remain nameless. And we also worked uh, on uh, kind of hybrids of uh, aesthetics uh, in order, again, to uh, lose ourselves uh, even deeper into the kind of potential uh, collaborations and co potential coexistences with other cultures. Um, I counted on the strangeness uh, and eccentricity of the surrounding buildings uh, to make uh, our building look uh, extremely pure and new. Uh, and there was only one device that we developed uh, with the engineers uh, of an Arab, where with minimal effort, the building was able to rotate. Uh, so that uh, its uh, long side would never be exposed to the sun. So in 24 hours, the building would... appear and, and disappear. And so my contribution or my intervention in this kind of skyline was then, in this case, a kind of uh, a radical uh, f form of erasure, uh, perhaps. There's a second uh, uh, tendency that I think could be a hopeful way to uh, overcome uh, the, the current excess. Uh, and that is, um, uh, again, an extreme engagement with the uh, program and with how things work uh, and also with the kind of urban condition. Uh, this is a, a competition in, uh, for a theater in Tarpey uh, Tarpey is a very energetic uh, Asian city uh, with incredible street life, uh, 
I think of in the entire world, the inhabitants of Tape go to bed latest. Uh, and it is one of those civilizations which uh, somehow doesn't have to question itself, which has a kind of uh, self-evident uh, energy in terms of establishing life. Uh, there is a kind of huge night market, and, and interestingly enough, the theater was planned on, on the same site, and what we decided to propose, that it would be simply kind of superimposed, so that there is a second soco of nightlife, a night market, on which the theater rests. Now, the typical uh, theater, and, and, and this is where uh, the icon and the kind of star architects uh, are kind of really uh, having a terrible effect uh, on the world. This is the um, uh, theater in Beijing of Paul André. Uh, it is three theaters. Uh, everywhere in the world, you s suddenly see cultural centers kind of emerging with three theaters. And kind of somehow each theater is uh, in and of itself perfect. A big auditorium, a stage, side stages, backstage, uh, other auditorium, side stages. So uh, although this is a kind of vast investment uh, in culture, uh, in terms of theater or in terms of what the theater can do, there's absolutely no uh, additional contribution or, or no additional uh, uh, effect. So uh, the content uh, of this iconic building is uh, deeply reactionary and only its kind of cladding is, is new. And I think that there is a, a profound uh, malaise in that combination, uh, which is more and more common. So what we did in, in this case is, is different. Uh, instead of uh, one, three separate theaters, we combined the theater uh, accommodation of each uh, theater. Uh, in a single tower or in a single kind of volume so that the addition of all theaters uh, in itself vastly extended the range and the potential of what could be performed. So theaters could be coupled so that uh, a, a conventional theater gets uh, unusual depth. In certain cases, uh, we could even have uh, about 300 meters of theatrical space uh, accessible and, and usable uh, in such a device, so that the typical kind of uh, spectacle that can only be uh, performed in uh, industrial space, uh, because the theaters are too constrained, in this case can also take place uh, kind of inside th this event. But then let me talk about the, the Hermitage, because that is uh, what I uh, came here to do and uh, what I will do. Um, the Hermitage uh, is, this is a graph that shows Wall Street going up and down, and it is also showing the extent to which all museums that we are familiar with, from the Louvre to the Metropolitan to uh, the Guggenheim, uh, f more or less followed this graph and get extended uh, uh, relentlessly uh, in pure sympathy with the market. Um, what we see is a vast explosion of the scale of museums. Uh, this is Mies van der Rohe Museum in Berlin. What we have since is museums that are extending and extending and reaching proportions that uh, museums never ex uh, reached before. Therefore, the audience uh, is colossal and constantly increasing, uh, and there is a kind of demand for a particular kind of art. The museum becomes uh, inundated uh, and, and completely uh, kind of circulation device. The crowds are uh, enormous and more and more the particular experience that is the essence of the museum, uh, a, a quite contemplation with the museum is, is becoming uh, rare. Uh, it's m apparently inevitable, this uh, process. So in that sense, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but I would say that the same phenomenon also forces the art to become uh, more large scale uh, and therefore more mass oriented uh, and to uh, address this experience and, and be stretched to the limit of what art uh, could possibly be. 
Uh, and in the end, uh, and, and this is uh, for me a kind of uh, actually sinister moment, uh, become uh, purely authoritarian. I think that uh, for anyone who has seen this uh, work in the Tate uh, and also who has seen the way in which it could be only adored with people on their knees, literally, uh, um, uh, it kind of testifies to uh, a radical form of aggression uh, that art uh, used not to uh, possess and a kind of unilateral message, a, a almost militaristic message in the kind of potency of art that uh, I would say is a kind of direct consequence uh, of this endless expansion and the kind of following of the Wall Street curve. Now, um, I was not immune to the same uh, uh, tendency. Uh, I worked with uh, Tom Krenz, uh, but I also worked uh, in the same context uh, for the uh, person who eventually became the client for the Hermitage. Uh, together, we made uh, as an insert in a casino in Las Vegas a metal strong box of Corten steel uh, with pivoting walls uh, that could, through magnets, uh, accommodate uh, actually very pure and kind of uh, beautiful art, the art of the Hermitage. Uh, and in a certain way, uh, inside this kind of grotesque cyclone of the economy, uh, we made a relatively protected area uh, dedicated in a relatively pure way to uh, both the containment and, and the display of, of art. So uh, it, that was the first way uh, in which we uh, got to know each other, uh, Potosky and myself. And then soon in the summer of 2000, uh, year 2000, Krenz, uh, Frank Gehry and I, uh, went to Petersburg for the first time to see what we could do in a hermitage. The hermitage is a series of buildings uh, on the Neva. Uh, in front is Winter Square. Winter. Uh, it is a palace, uh, a small hermitage and a museum. And what was new in 2000 is that this office building, the general staff building, would be added to the uh, properties of the group, uh, Hermitage and that therefore the uh, plaza in, in front, Winter Square, would be uh, also incorporated so that from a huge complex of buildings uh, it became kind of much more almost an urban quarter. Um, basically the Hermitage had uh, stubbornly resisted the, the market uh, through terrorism, communism, it, it kind of uh, uh, showed a totally flat line. Uh, and its uh, issues were actually very uh, suggestive. Uh, altogether, the existing complex had 1,200 rooms, and to those 12 room, 100 rooms would be added another 800 rooms. So altogether, the Hermitage would have 2,000 rooms. And not only simply rooms, but in this code, uh, you see that red are rooms that are historical and that therefore need to be uh, preserved in their entirety. And in the other colors, you see gradual kind of uh, levels of historicity and therefore uh, uh, issues of raising issues of preservation. Krenz and, and Gary looked and made an inventory and very soon came to the conclusion that uh, the problem of the Hermitage with its uh, 2,000 rooms was that it had no spaces big enough for American art. Uh, uh, American art had grown considerably uh, over the space of the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. Uh, and therefore, it was clear that uh, uh, space it needed to be found to accommodate uh, this uh, enormous growth. And, and that was a moment uh, of serious bifurcation uh, where I felt that kind of perhaps there were other issues uh, in Hermitage that uh, could be addressed uh, and uh, where I actually felt that the Hermitage itself suggested completely other ways of looking at art and that if 
only those kind of implications could be mobilized against uh, some of the excess. The Hermitage itself uh, had contained uh, prototypes uh, for uh, resistance against the whole uh, phenomenon that I've been talking about. What was unique, if you look then at Hermitage, is that um, in terms of curatorial uh, exposition, it was uh, a scandal. Uh, paint was imperfect, uh, there was no air conditioning. Uh, uh, you looked uh, uh, through the windows to the outside. Uh, uh, there was no uh, shadow, uh, there was kind of full exposure. But still, uh, the experience of looking and being there was extremely powerful and strong. And here, the Malevich's black square, perhaps one of the most important paintings of the 20th century, was hung with minimal protection, uh, with fluorescent light, uh, with a crazily uh, overdimensioned label, and between two crazy uh, curtains. <laughs> But still, the intensity of the experience was literally breathtaking and was increasingly absent uh, from the museums that were then uh, readying themselves for the 21st century. Uh, and, and that kind of really became very significant uh, as a uh, potential form of uh, uh, dialectics, uh, let's say, or perhaps polemics. Also, if you looked around in the museum, you saw everywhere kind of found displays, and this is one of them, uh, where simply arranged on tables and on wrapping papers, there were seemingly random collections of, of artworks, sometimes with a density of 500 per square meters, uh, and that were kind of dedicated, if you looked carefully, to mythology, religion, militaristic uh, uh, ex exploits, sex, and other uh, mysticism, and other domains, and uh, confronted uh, with each other in uh, proximity that, again, was not available in uh, uh, traditional curatorial regimes, but still uh, very powerful in, in, in the, what it delivered uh, in terms of emotion and insight. Um, and so, my argument with uh, Krenz started that if a space for the motorcycle show was needed, that perhaps you could uh, arrange a motorcycle in every one of the rooms, uh, and without further disturbing the museums or kind of uh, radicalizing the museum, and looking further into the uh, partly dilapidated spaces of the uh, building, uh, it, I developed the kind of idea that kind of perhaps uh, that dilapidation itself was a very significant part of Russian's history, Soviet history. Uh, the military had actually uh, occupied the building. It was occupied during the war. And that therefore, kind of rather than rehabilitate or renew such a building, uh, it was perhaps important to uh, also preserve uh, its rawness and its uh, dilapidation. So we started to experimenting with uh, an, a thesis that perhaps you could shift the most important works of art to the most distressed environments so that people would come there uh, and, and create uh, an, an ambiguous spectacle of recent history and treasures uh, and old history uh, in, in ways that would come mutually uh, enlighten each other. Uh, and we committed ourselves that our only intervention, uh, if anything, was not uh, an architectural contribution, but at the most an elimination, uh, an elimination uh, on the condition that it would clarify the structure and the kind of organization of all these buildings and clarify perhaps also the circulation. So basically that project became then the beginning of uh, uh, a more formal uh, engagement uh, with the Hermitage, where since uh, a year we are making a master plan for the year 2014, but where based on some of these ideas and some of these observations, we are looking at the Hermitage as a whole, and, and therefore uh, pursuing kind of, you know, in, in this stock market situation, uh, 
at the moment that it goes down uh, a kind of sudden extension uh, of the hermitage um, in order to you know, find our own way to address uh, the issues of the 21st century. But the advantages, of course, that we are late, uh, the advantages, of course, that we have seen the price that so many of these kind of museums are paying kind of with their now almost uncontrollable size and with also the uh, price they're paying in terms of a kind of flattening uh, of the experience that is uh, very often uh, 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 what, they, what they have to offer compared to their earlier uh, incarnations. So in that sense, it's, it's uh, very exciting to be able to do it uh, in hindsight. The Hermitage is a kind of huge museum. It's almost un unimaginably big, 200,000 square meters. And, and each of its components compares with another major museums. So one of the components, the Winter Palace, is almost as big as the Metropolitan. So it's actually more than five museums, where typical museums are uh, subdivided in departments uh, the Hermitage has so many departments that it is almost a barcode uh, and, and for that reason uh, it uh, implies and, and kind of enforces on its uh, visitors uh, but also on its guides and also on its kind of system of uh, displays uh, an unbelievably intricate uh, regime uh, where uh, a, a very kind of only a very twisted road uh, is able to take in the kind of range of its treasures and, and the range of its uh, departments. That gives a kind of very unfortunate thing that, you know, in this uh, uh, previously hallowed uh, spaces uh, uh, where you still kind of feel the spirit of, of uh, significant events, whether it was the revolution or incarceration or bombing or is now, you know, uh, 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 invaded by uh, a kind of horde uh, uh, that, that has to move kind of simply uh, in order to capture the things in this relentless uh, queue. And this kind of reminded me of the film uh, The Ark, this uh, famous film that uh, was very popular among uh, kind of intellectuals, where somehow this same kind of journey through the Hermitage was kind of enacted uh, as a, a symbolism of Russia's history uh, in a kind of series of episodes that were constantly kind of moving through the entire museum. And in fact, uh, this is uh, the, the claim to fame of the movie was that it was uh, taken in a single take. And this is the kind of trajectory of the take, which in fact follows the trajectory of the uh, current guests. And so when I kind of really realized this obligatory path uh, and, and how this obligatory path is actually the hostile to the authentic experience of a museum, which is a, a space where you are free to wander and, and free to engage uh, with a number of um, individual treasures uh, in a way that is not necessarily programmed, uh, and uh, where you can find uh, intimacy with uh, 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 interfaces of your choice, uh, that all of this was actually drastically antithetical to that uh, experience and hostile to it, and that uh, perhaps one of the things, the Hermitage was at this point that airports also know, where it can no longer be extended, but where the components have to become uh, autonomous. So. Perhaps our, our first and most significant proposal is that where the hermitage is now, this one, this network uh, with a continuous flow, that we kind of propose uh, a degree of separation between the elements uh, and therefore a degree of autonomy, which means that each of these parts can now be interpreted for what they are rather than uh, as part, interpreted as part of a larger whole. And then we kind of recognized that the Winter Palace actually was the palace of the Tsars and therefore is not a museum. Uh, that the Tsars themselves made a small hermitage which was conceived as an exhibition building. So therefore it was a private museum. And then later the Tsars built uh, and, and ordered the uh, arch German architect Klenze uh, 
to build the new Hermitage, which actually was a public museum, so that uh, if we reintroduce that autonomy, uh, the different parts uh, also kind of regain their uh, original, uh, not role necessarily, but their original status, uh, and can be interpreted uh, as separate uh, entities, which also clarifies, of course, the kind of history uh, of, of Russia. And that then the um, challenge uh, becomes uh, how to distribute over these 2,000 rooms in five buildings, the three and a half million artifacts uh, of, the of the Hermitage in such a way that the artifacts find their ideal uh, environment, uh, but that also the history uh, of Russia as it is embodied uh, in this building can find its own articulation and sometimes separately and sometimes kind of engaged and combined uh, with each other. So this is the blueprint. What we will kind of try to develop uh, over the next uh, years is the kind of political history, the acquisition history of the Tsars, the kind of museum history of this uh, building, and the uh, former office building will be then uh, kind of more uh, a history of the kind of contemporary uh, kind of laboratory for the uh, uh, investigation of uh, contemporary conditions. So from a path which uh, in a way became a kind of hysterical, another uh, labyrinth, uh, uh, what this uh, offers is kind of basically uh, three relatively serene, relatively clear uh, forms of uh, circulation. Uh, each building will now kind of acquire its own entrance and therefore the experience will become much less uh, exhaustive, uh, much less uh, eclectic and kind of perhaps more therefore profound with only uh, in the north along the river a kind of single element that still will offer a degree of connection between the entities. It's a very beautiful uh, space uh, because the windows are on the river with a very beautiful light that penetrates uh, in that space. And one of the intentions, uh, now that not everything is dedicated to art, but where now that history will uh, acquire an equivalent status uh, to the art, uh, it will also enable us to uh, restore to a degree of presence uh, episodes in Russia's history, such as this one in World War I, where uh, one of the important rooms was used as a kind of hospital, uh, a completely erased and forgotten uh, moment that will be discreetly brought back. Uh, we will also be able to uh, restore, uh, 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 how shall I say, privacy to some of the paintings, uh, Leonardo's, that are simply uh, overexposed by creating kind of areas of relative uh, rarity of circulation, er areas of relative privacy, so that there is intensity here, but a lesser intensity in the other areas, so that the remote areas will be used for perhaps the most uh, 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 significant art and therefore again reintroduce uh, a degree of privacy. If we look at history uh, uh, and we can look at the Tsars themselves, Catherine the Great, uh, a great collector, uh, she collected libraries uh, of the Enlightenment, paintings, uh, people, uh, architects. Uh, in her whole uh, uh, life, she collected uh, 4,000 paintings, drawings, uh, 80,000 etchings, uh, uh, enormous amount of books, uh, but she's not recognized uh, as such in the Hermitage, so that kind of collecting will also be present so that uh, in a kind of very visual manner uh, you can look at uh, what is going on in the, you, you can you will be confronted with that kind of history rather than with the results of that history. Um, perhaps the most um, complex question is how we can uh, f make a history coexist with some of the collections. Uh, 
This is, for instance, the current uh, uh, environment of the Islamic collection. Uh, the Hermitage has a kind of vast collection of Islamic art, uh, perhaps the biggest in the world, uh, which, of course, uh, at the moment is a very uh, rare given uh, and a very important given in terms in a political sense. It is now displaced in a kind of stripped uh, apartment uh, from the last uh, Tsars. Uh, you see kind of display cases all over and a kind of vaguely historical but uh, actually clean and laundered uh, environment. Uh, this is how this space looked uh, uh, previously. And so what we are going to experiment with is to perhaps uh, create a very narrow band or path of the Islamic art that will traverse the kind of historical apartments where their history uh, is to the extent that we can still uh, can uh, also restore it. So it's all almost based on a kind of Roman mo model of trophies uh, or uh, an earlier kind of version of in, in the Hermitage, a kind of river of artworks uh, going to historical environment uh, where uh, in this kind of restored spaces there is simply a kind of central band that continues and that will enable you to experience the two conditions uh, at the same time. Uh, we have the kind of rare privilege of, of not only being architects but also uh, being invited to, to have a kind of curatorial involvement uh, in, in the whole Hermitage. And one of the things we want to uh, uh, do is to create uh, exhibitions about the displays of the Hermitage and the different kind of periods of those displays, the kind of over-the-top fullness, uh, the kind of individual objects, uh, the vitrines, and the kind of Soviet uh, kind of version of, uh, of very didactic displays, all of that still has its own evidence there. So uh, our first proposal is to make uh, an exhibition where of simply display cases, uh, uh, which will uh, enable uh, us to uh, create a kind of historical overview from the 16th century to the 21st century from kind of meticulous uh, gold uh, work to current uh, multi-purpose uh, vitrines in uh, a single uh, display uh, of, of displays, uh, which as far as we know has, is, is kind of one element that has never really been taken seriously at that level. And we will do that at a kind of Kunsthalle that we are opening here in the form of pr uh, former stables uh, in the kind of herma in the ground floor of the small hermitage, so in that sense, uh, not only are we kind of re-looking at the identity of each of the elements, and and in, in a way restoring some of that identity as an autonomous entity, but we are also able to explore cavities or unused parts, uh, uh, and 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 insert there the uh, elements that will enable the Hermitage to uh, work in this uh, century and to also create the kind of energy and vitality necessary for uh, life in the 21st century. So you this display view. And finally, a kind of a laboratory that is we introduced uh, in, in a burnt part of the Hermitage, so an issue, a section where there are uh, no uh, issues of preservation, uh, where there will be a laboratory of different kind of display conditions uh, as a kind of permanent test for other parts of the her uh, Hermitage. And finally, another notion uh, that we hope to launch that in a museum with so many rooms, uh, which wants to be a kind of museum uh, perhaps of the 21st century, that one very promising strategy could be that each year uh, you, for instance, ask eight artists or four artists and four scientists or uh, kind of uh, a, a number of disciplines to take a room and to kind of organize something in that room. 
And after 100 years, you have 800 rooms that inevitably represent that century uh, in a more precise way than kind of almost any form of uh, acquisition uh, or curatorial kind of regime could ever hope to rep represent uh, a century. So where the Hermitage kind of simply exploits its abundance of rooms rather than its uh, size. So finally, the, it's not only uh, a kind of project about uh, buildings. Uh, this is the Hermitage the way it was, a kind of perimeter with a kind of vast complex inside. Uh, it will now become uh, urban space with a number of individual buildings. Uh, and so therefore, in addition to the 2,000 rooms, there is also these interiors, uh, exterior spaces that kind of form together a network and that also deserve a degree of programming, uh, but also deserve, of course, to be left alone. Uh, and, and this is the kind of thin line uh, that we are uh, uh, walking. Uh, this kind of space will be opened, uh, but perhaps uh, left alone. Uh, because uh, again here some of the kind of fragility of the building and some of the kind of uh, unofficial remnants uh, in terms of old cars uh, that are still around uh, may be uh, kind of simply accessible without making a kind of further big deal. And the kind of central and perhaps most crucial part of the space is the square itself, uh, which is unbelievably powerful and, and beautiful in, in terms of its almost permanent emptiness. Uh, and that is an emptiness that we uh, want to respect and kind of maintain. Uh, so there will be no programming uh, and actually uh, kind of subtle way of making programming impossible. But at the same time, uh, as it was in, 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 in Russian history, uh, perhaps uh, there will be occasional kind of use of it or occasional thinking about it uh, and, and perhaps uh, a kind of subtle sense of connection and uh, urban quarter. And so from this position, uh, and this is a distribution of museums in the world, uh, uh, the Hermitage is here. Of course, there's America, Europe with incredible density, but the Hermitage kind of uh, proposes to do and is ideally placed is to kind of really intervene in this part of the world, you know, kind of which where museums are relatively rare uh, and with its uh, uh, enormous collection of Islamic art, it will uh, probably, uh, and Chinese art, it will probably create a, a number of ties and forms of uh, communication uh, that uh, enable it to uh, develop, uh, let's say, a political dimension that uh, most museums can only dream of. Thank you very much. Take some questions, but we, can we use the microphone because there are six more spaces that will only hear you if you use the microphone. Yep. Hey, Professor Kuas, I'm really excited that you're here tonight. I'm I'm Chen, uh, Master of Architecture Year One student. I'm, uh, 20 years ago, you made a very important uh, statement that uh, what almost nobody really understands about architecture is that it is a paradoxical mixture of power and powerlessness. And 20 years later, I uh, am very interested in your reinterpretation of your statement 20 years ago. And I guess many architects today have already admitted your statement in some way, and many have uh, started to believe. So that as a Chinese, I'm very interested in your, uh, your understanding of 
uh, urban China. Do you perceive urban China as a, a dialectic between power and powerlessness? Thank you. You mean uh, urban China? You mean the, the current condition of China? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I think that um, uh, this combination of power and powerlessness, uh, I think, uh, could have probably uh, emanated from from every uh, pore uh, uh, of this lecture, um, uh, and uh, I think. Um, Any architect working in China uh, is, of course, um, has, has a kind of dual responsibility yeah, because he is aware, uh, you are aware that you're part of a system that uh, can, uh, um, how shall I say this, in a kind of intelligent way. Let, let me put it this way. I think that if you do not Kind of realize um, ideological uh, ambitions in China. Uh, I think you are not worth to operate in China, and I think there is a lot of uh, kind of relatively harmless uh, 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 work in being done in China, which doesn't uh, have any kind of identifiable benefit to, to China, and which uh, increasingly uh, Chinese can do kind of very well. Uh, and, and I think that is uh, kind of clearly happening uh, that China Chinese will uh, d simply complete their own country and, and, and be the first b beneficiaries you know, of the energies uh, and intelligence of their country. Um, on the other hand, if you get a kind of rare opportunity of uh, being able to intervene, then I think it is very, very crucial um, that you uh, make <coughs> a particular statement or try to make a particular statement and uh, try to introduce something that uh, didn't or doesn't uh, kind of previously uh, exist uh, in China. And, and I think it is uh, exactly on, uh, at that point that you are also uh, in a very torn situation between the West and the East, you know, because exactly doing that is what the West thinks you should not do. And, uh, not doing it uh, is what the East uh, would hate you for not doing. Uh, so um, that is kind of really all I can say. Thank you. So, Hi. Um, of the oh. sort of introductory part of the yeah. lecture. And while pure has a connotation of innocence, it also, yeah. in the 20th century, has other connotations to it. And given your interest in history and the sort of significance of the delicate line between history and engagement, I was, I was just curious about your insistence on maintaining that separation between the two terms. Between simple and pure? Yeah. Uh, I'm not so sure it was a kind of really an intellectual statement, yeah? Uh, I, I, I basically, um, I, I felt that it was uh, kind of very important to uh, think about the issue of purity again, you know, uh, and, and so I would, uh, and not necessarily about the simplicity again, because I, I, I take the simplicity dimension back and, and uh, would kind of like to leave the suggestion of purity or the comp the complication of purity uh, or the issue of purity uh, uh, floating. Hi, thank you for a brilliant lecture. I really en enjoyed it. I had a simple question. Uh, 2014, uh, what, is what is that date? Uh, well, I think that uh, uh, one of the kind of really weird things about the architecture is that the fewer and fewer uh, architectural enterprises uh, kind of run their own course, but more and more are connected with completely random dates, like uh, the 250th existence of the Hermitage or the 60th birthday of the Chinese Republic or the 50th uh, 
birthday of CCTV. So uh, I think that our, you know, uh, uh, the weird connection to politics uh, uh, gives a kind of proliferation of dates, and this is one of those dates. Uh, I think it's a date that uh, Hermitage uh, exists 250 years, but I am not sure from what point they start counting. <laughs> 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 Um, to what extent in this project uh, you thought or you did a rereading about concepts uh, developed in the 50s in England, such as I'm thinking about uh, Edric Price non intervention, non plan, and yeah. Alison and Peter Smithson's as found? Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> Basically, uh, I'm a kind of continental European, uh, and um, uh, uh, when I first came to England, uh, I, I thought I had come to a barbaric country um, <laughs> uh, uh, of uh, Anglo-Saxon intuitions uh, that I found completely incomprehensible and uh, that uh, really irritated me uh, highly because they were so uh, unrigorous and, and um, undisciplined. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, uh, I, I spent a lot of time there and uh, in the end, not so much surrendered, but uh, partly by osmosis and, and partly uh, through sheer confrontation, uh, I uh, became deeply familiar you know, with that form of thinking uh, without necessarily um, going over to the, to the other side. Uh, but uh, I, I do agree that uh, there is a dimension of uh, that kind of Englishness, whether it's Cedric Price, the Smithsons, or even uh, I would say somebody like Denise Scott Brown was uh, kind of basically uh, nurtured in that same uh, milieu. Uh, which I find uh, and have found for a long time deeply impressive uh, because it is uh, an, an early sign to live with things uh, as they are, uh, which of course for an architect is a very unusual uh, attitude. And from which I learned in that sense uh, a lot. Yeah. Hi, um, your design for the Hermitage reminds me a lot of the Museum of Jurassic Technology in Los Angeles. I'm not sure if you've ever been there. And they sort of call into question through sort of curatorial techniques the truthfulness of the art that they display, which is both fabricated and sort of, I guess, what people wouldn't consider art. Did you consider sort of the truthfulness of the objects in the museum? And some of the displays definitely seem sort of like alternative histories. Um. I, I think that, uh, that that may be uh, something that uh, kind of eventually we, we, we will do. Uh, but I think it's more, uh, for the moment, it's not kind of really, really the issue. It's, it, the issue is now to disentangle the, the layers and, and to understand what we can do, uh, as I said, in terms of mutual enlightenment uh, of those layers. Yeah? Uh, so it's not, in that sense, uh, not yet, um, critical operation in that way, except uh, to say that uh, to some extent the whole collection is also uh, a kind of random uh, series of acquisitions uh, of, of, of a kind of random family. Uh, it has an enormous amount of, for instance, military paraphernalia, but also uniforms, also underpants, also, uh, so in that sense, the sheer range in itself uh, eventually which, which now can never be kind of represented as a range, but is typically kind of represented almost as a kind of cocktail. Uh, but by giving each part its due, then I'm sure that at some point there will be quite stunning uh, kind of oppositions between, you know, or questions what is art and what is not art. <laughs> 
Um, exactly. Uh, the first, first round where he was first. He's been waiting. Sorry. Uh, I think uh, it was a fascinating uh, journey through one of the most interesting uh, historical labyrinths in, mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, I'm curious about the building of the uh, former uh, military uh, headquarters, which mm -hmm. is sort of uh, ruin of the of Soviet Russian slash Soviet mm -hmm. military power, like we like there are so many in Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'm interested in in two two possibly connected issues. One is this uh, sort of uh, vast uh, uh, opportunity in which you have more degrees of freedom than in the uh, other buildings which mm -hmm. are located close to the Neva. Uh, so how much can you uh, freeze them in time as you were suggesting you would like to do in a sort of Kabakovian uh, yeah. situation? Uh, how could you possibly uh, articulate the, the management of these spaces with what you seem to be saying with your uh, yearly commissions to eight, to eight artists that is, in fact, for the first time in, in almost one century, the redevelopment of an active policy of collecting okay. in a place which got stuck with okay. what was there in 1917. Okay. So, uh, in short, what are the degrees of freedom between the newly concrete space and a, a collection to be created. Um, that that can really remain to be uh, seen, but I should say that uh, the kind of second building, the, the general staff building, is actually uh, com uh, when when I first was involved, uh, th these kind of these iterations about the neglected, the, the the not only the beauty but also the. Uh, the, the credibility of the neglected parts were uh, simply uh, my own observations. Uh, and I was, in a way, projected on an architectural team that was uh, doing, uh, uh, let's say, the modernization. And in that sense, uh, that section of our work uh, will may appear, uh, reappear at some point. Uh, but for the moment, uh, there are two Russian architects uh, who are uh, working there. And uh, to say the least, they have not uh, adopted our uh, kind of sensitivity. Uh, uh, but, uh, but we are uh, pushing back. Uh, and, and so I think that the, 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 the end result will be a kind of standoff, uh, uh, perhaps a creative standoff. Exactly. Uh, one month ago, um, today, Barack Obama gave his inauguration speech, where um, he basically said that the, gave his answer to the global financial crisis in, in um, virtues and shared values, essentially history. And tonight, you started by um, crossing out the yes regime and saying that we're kind mm -hmm. of entering into a new phase. And in the strategy part of your talk, you <clears throat> you offered history. And so I guess I'm wondering if you are offering history to the Hermitage project or to the architectural discipline. Is it important? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, why do you uh, why do you even ask? Yeah? I mean, um, it, it's it's basically kind of suggesting a kind of uh, self consciousness. Um, basically, this is a op obviously an, a unique opportunity to to explore many 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 different. Uh, and if I extract something of kind of general value. Uh, uh, that will be great, but that is not my primary concern. And my primary concern in our actual work is never to, to give lessons or to give uh, prescripts. I mean, that's what we use our books for. And last question. Yeah. Uh, why this project was asked uh, for? Is uh, the museology or museography of the Hermitage in bad condition? Uh, is it not uh, well enough uh, organized to receive such amount of uh, visitors? Because I was there in 2006 for the first time, and the sensation was to enter a museum what, that was arranged by, uh, on the age of Soviets, of the Soviets, and uh, has been kept up to 
2006, where I was here, almost intact in that way. Uh, are you with the project, the authorities there, and your projects, do they want the Russians to become at the level of other European great museums? No, no. I, I, I think that um, it's a very good question, uh, by the way, but um, I think the, the reason uh, that we were invited is that we simply showed uh, less of a kind of zeal uh, of in terms of uh, changing the whole situation and that we became actually fascinated by the conditions uh, there and that, that uh, conveyed um, uh, simply um, was proof of the ability to enjoy a thing for its own sake and not uh, necessarily uh, wanting to radically change it with, which typically is, is the mission of the architect. And so uh, I think the reason that we were invited is that we um, uh, found a resonant partner in, in the director who also wanted to uh, kind of explore a number of subtle shifts and also wanted to uh, have his curatorial team uh, challenged and, and uh, stimulated uh, to uh, rethink what the hermitage could be, or to think what the hermitage could be. Yeah? So it's in that sense, not only our work, but uh, it's a kind of very much a kind of shared effort uh, between ourselves and, and the hermitage. And so it's almost, we are almost <laughs> embedded there and become part of, of the whole system uh, of the hermitage. So it's uh, in a way transformation from the inside, kind of rather than uh, trans and. In terms of, um, I, I think there is even kind of right now, and, and that is, uh, as you know, very rare in Russia in itself, there is even now an awareness that whatever the Soviet period left there uh, deserves in part to be also visible uh, as part of all the other entities. And, and in that sense, uh, I think that is a very important step because uh, as you know, uh, everywhere in the world, uh, uh, there is a kind of general consensus that everything basically built between the 60s and the 90s uh, deserves to disappear. So it's, uh, I mean, this last comment makes perfectly clear why Paul Byard would have been so touched that you were the person to speak in his name. and. I just ask all of you sometime this evening to raise your glass to Paul uh, and the idea that he had, which is in a way uh, a simple idea about affection for buildings and for the people who produce them. And uh, if you're gonna do a drawing, any kind of drawing which has thinking on one side of the drawing, then Rem's name will appear in that part of the drawing. And that's why it's an honor for us that he's yeah, back. Thank you.